Welcome to this supplementary unit on the course Self-Determination in the Post-Colonial World. In this unit, I'm going to look at the question of sanctions or siege. In other words, what's commonly called sanctions, but in most cases, uh, illegal uh, unilateral coercive measures, otherwise known as siege warfare, and the importance to distinguish between the two. I'm going to look at it in three sections. First of all, to introduce the concept of hybrid warfare and the role of siege warfare and hybrid warfare. Secondly, to distinguish between what are legitimate sanctions under international law and the unilateral coercive measures and other forms of siege warfare. And finally, to look at the different approaches to addressing siege warfare in the world today. In hybrid warfare in recent decades, as Washington's relative economic power declines, it launched a series of hybrid wars in attempts to preserve its position in the world, especially its influence in Europe and Asia and in the parts in between in Central and Western Asia. So this self-styled hegemon faces a new great game, which like previous great games, forms a strategic context for many regional wars. For example, in the 19th century, the great game was the uh, rivalry between the British and Russian empires, and that led to a number of particular wars and regional wars in Central Asia, in Persia and in India. In the 20th century, it was the Cold War between the US-led bloc and the Soviet Union-led bloc, um, and there were some substantial wars. It wasn't a period of peace. There were huge wars in Korea, in Vietnam, throughout Africa in the, post in the, the end of the colonial era there, and throughout Latin America in particular. In the 21st century, we see the US concerned about a threat from new power blocks in Eurasia and in West Asia and Central Asia, particularly those linked to China and Russia, and it's led to the US initiating a series of wars in the Middle East, in Central Asia and in East Europe, in addition to its interventions in Africa and Latin America. Well, hybrid warfare is another way of talking about fourth generation warfare, and it's nothing uh, particularly uh, mystical, this expression. It's a conceptual term rather than a historical term. It refers to fourth generation war, refers to a first generation so-called of fixed line or trench warfare, then a second, which is to do with attrition, um, artillery barrage followed by infantry uh, advances, third maneuverability, the so-called blitzkrieg wars where speed, surprise and outflanking take place, and finally, multiple and complex front wars with the regular agents, in other words, proxies or terrorist armies, economic wars and legitimacy wars. Now, these have been around for a very long time. It's nothing particularly new. For example, economic sieges go back many, many centuries. Propaganda war, contracted terrorism, they've all been around for many centuries. Psychological operations like the Trojan horse um, back in, uh, in ancient times, for example. So in the current era, economic sieges, including blockades, um, naval and air blockades, have been rebadged as sanctions to make them seem judicious and legitimate. So in this context, it's important for us to distinguish between those sanctions, in other words, a some sort of punishment or corrective measure for wrongdoing imposed in accordance with international norms from those which are not. Um, but when we research this, we have to notice that in the, the English language literature these days, most of the discussion of hybrid warfare or fourth generation war um, is talking about a strategy used by those opposed to the imperial powers. So what's being done by the Russians or um, by Hezbollah or, or some other um, dissident groups in Latin America, for example. I think it's easy just to um, talk about the lot as hybrid warfare and recognize that these different dimensions of aggressive um, attacks and resistance that are going on. We need to look at this in context of the relative economic decline of the United States of America and the consequences of that. Now, there's been a long-term productivity and trade, industrial, technological decline, including reducing the US share of global GDP since the late 60s and particularly since the, in terms of trade, since the mid 80s. Um, so that's led Washington to declare um, these new doctrines, which are attempting to contain geopolitical rival rivals, to enforce monopoly privileges, that is to say the um, privileges of its own corporations to invest, um, intellectual property rights, IPRs, the claiming um, uh, stronger 
uh, claims over those intellectual property rights to extend the period of patents and and copyright, for example, um, and you know launching aggression against China and many other countries for uh, the so-called theft of its intellectual property. Whereas intellectual property, not that long ago, was something that was shared much more freely. With the US final, failing globalism, there have been attempts to create regional blocks. That is to say, when the WTO uh, wasn't able to uh, carry all of the agendas, the investment agendas in particular, of the um, of the US, then there are these new regional blocks, Trans-Pacific, Transatlantic, and so on. There's an attempt to seek the division uh, of regional blocks or to capture peripheral states too, and that's a context to this to this war. Washington strategically sees a threat from Eurasia and any other independent power blocks. And in the 21st century, it's attempted to create a new Middle East, what it saw as a new Middle East, that is to say a region subordinated to the interests of the US, which is in another continent, and not a European power, not an Asian power, but with traditional imperial aims, trying to control an entire resource rich region, dictate the terms of access to others, especially in light of the Russian influence in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, uh, in light of China's expansion, especially the Belt and Road mega infrastructure network, which is illustrated in the in the graphic there in the bottom right, and the likelihood of strong links being formed, new links being formed between Europe, Russia and China, which would weaken the US position in both Europe and China. So this is the umbrella type of context for these uh, new Middle East wars that I mentioned. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative by China is particularly important, and of course, that's something that extends into Central and Western Asia, which is the focus of a large number of wars in recent times. It's the world's largest project of connectivity in modern times, the Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt links China with Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, Russia and Europe by land, and the road is a sea route um, connecting China with Southeast and South Asia. East Africa and the Middle East. And there are these technolo technological wars too, with the US taking these unilateral aggressive measures against successful Chinese companies like Huawei, for example. Washington couldn't pursue its anti-Eurasian or new Middle East objectives by conventional war or economic domination. So it's resorted to hybrid war using client states to finance mass terrorism. For example, the Saudis in the Middle East financing the Al Qaeda groups and ISIS, for example, economic siege measures called sanctions against dozens of countries, for example, against little Yemen, the air and sea blockade imposed by the Saudis is of course dictated by Washington. Mass propaganda through both state and corporate media and by gaining control of or placing constraints on social media, the new uh, censorship wars in the social media and reliance on a series of imperial doctrines, some of them well established, some of them relatively new, such as smart power, which is another way of talking about hybrid war and getting other states to carry on the, the, the task that, you, that Washington mandates, full spectrum dominance, a uh, Pentagon doctrine from its uh, statement from the, the year 2000 of trying to control technological, communicational, economic spheres, as well as just the military sphere. An early 21st century doctrine destroying disconnectedness, that is to say, regarding as enemies, those that stay outside the globalist or regional hegemonic structures created for them, like little Libya, for example, which was destroyed for its role in trying to create autonomous networks in Africa. Uh, exceptionalism, which is an old concept, which is by which the US regards itself as a state that is not bound by normal rules, uh, such as those created by international law. You see some of the US um, clients or colonies such as Israel also taking that role that they don't regard themselves subject to international law. And the newer doctrine of a responsibility to protect, which is a new pretext for intervention, um, supposedly consistent with international law, but in fact, breaching the norms of the, the UN Charter and the UN Security Council, which were set up specifically to prevent war. But in fact, they've provided this new RTP or R2P is provided a new pretext for intervention and for wars of aggression. So if independent states can't be made to submit, the plan B for them will be to weaken, divide and punish entire populations until they scream, such as the, the economic sieges against Lebanon and Syria, 
and Iraq and Yemen and, of course, the people of Palestine. So we see that expression scream in the, the siege that was carried out against the government of Salvador Allende, the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende in Chile in the early 70s when President Nixon at that time expressed the hope of forcing political upheaval and change by measures to, quote, make the economy scream, unquote just before the military coup that brought about the introduction of the dictator Augusto Pinochet seen there shaking hands with Nixon's Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. So to the second sec uh, section, economic war as sanctions. And this is the confusing part really of the international discussion because what are spoken of as sanctions in most cases are violations of international law and are better regarded as unilateral coercive measures. So let's see the difference between sanctions and these unilateral coercive measures which are part of what can be regarded more correctly as siege warfare. Under international law, a sanction implies the punitive or corrective outcome of some sort of judicious process. In traditional international law, there are really two principles said to limit a state's retaliation against others. One, that the response should be in proportion to an alleged action by the other. And secondly, that any reprisal only came after some attempts at negotiation. So, for example, it was said in relation to USA-Cuba relations in the early 60s, before 1962, that the US measures against Cuba might have been justifiable during a breakdown in negotiations over compensation for property nationalized in Cuba in 1960-61. There was a disagreement over the terms and eventually the US abandoned that in favor of these uh, coercive measures. The later coercive measures from 1962 onwards certainly breached a range of international laws and the concepts spoken of since then from the Cubans call all of the measures against Cuba are blockade, the US call them an embargo. Well, back at the time, US legal counsel acknowledged during plans to launch an actual naval blockade of Cuba that was linked to the, the stationing of Soviet missiles in Cuba, nuclear missiles, that blockade certainly had a warlike meaning. You couldn't talk about a, a Pacific blockade. Uh, so since then, the US has always spoken about an embargo for 10 or more measures that are really imposing unilateral coercive measures on Cuba. Um, and the, the Cuba persists in calling it a blockade. If, however, we look at the international sanctions against South Africa, beginning in the 1960s, for example, that was a judicious course, and it's worth looking at this to see what sanctions really are and might be. The sanctions against apartheid South Africa uh, began with a demand for boycott and sanctions on the apartheid system, um, charted by a broad coalition of popular movements in the late 1950s. The call for sanctions internationally came in the early 60s after mass organisations in South Africa were banned. And importantly, the boycott call was endorsed by South African groups and unions, those most likely to be affected by economic pressures. So this wasn't just a matter of international law, it was a matter of political legitimacy, that the people most likely to be affected by these measures uh, consented and agreed with it. They agreed with the objective of it and they agreed with the means. So in 1962, the UN General Assembly adopted Resolution 1761, which called on member states to impose sanctions on South Africa. In 1966, the UN General Assembly designated apartheid as a crime against humanity. That was put into a convention or a treaty in 1973. And in 1984, the UN Security Council finally endorsed it. In other words, it took more than two decades for the big powers who had typically supported apartheid South Africa, the NATO powers in particular, to come around to agreeing to um, finally draw a line against apartheid in South Africa. So one commentator back in the 60s says, the initiative for boycott and sanctions came from the National Liberation Movement of South Africa and was carried forward internationally with the support of African and other states, as well as men and women of conscience in Western countries. Only in the late 80s, in the final years of the apartheid system in South Africa, did Western states join in with these sanctions. And as apartheid was being dismantled in the early 90s, Nelson Mandela called for an end to those sanctions, except for those on weapons, until the transition was made. So that's a snapshot of actual sanctions in place against apartheid South Africa. And here is some of the documents I referred to the Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, 
1973 in the, in the UN General Assembly with a link there and the UN Resolution 1761 from 1962 calling for the international boycott. So the South African case could be a model for broad international and legitimate sanctions against apartheid Israel, for example, that is a declaration of apartheid in occupied Palestine as a crime against humanity, uh, measures of uh, signalling clear consent from those likely to be affected by the boycotts, that is to say the Palestinian people working in the apartheid system and arguments that this was going to affect their employment, for example. A boycott by as many as the frontline states as possible, that is to say Lebanon, Syria, uh, and if there were any possibility from Egypt and Jordan as well, um, other countries in the region. A UN General Assembly endorsement of boycotts and sanctions against the apartheid Israeli regime. And in the final stages, Zionist internal morale would collapse and the Western states would be forced to lend support to dismantling the apartheid system, just as they had in the late 80s with apartheid South Africa. Well, however, unilateral coercive measures are different and illegal, but how are they different? Here are some of the main uh, differences. I've listed them as four for convenience. Most of Washington's unilateral coercive measures, which they call sanctions these days, are illegal for these four reasons. And I'll illustrate um, the evidence why they fit into these categories. First of all, international law prohibits economic coercion by the principle of non-intervention and an implied ban in the UN Charter to do with the sovereignty and independence of states. Second, the illegality is more obvious when there's an unlawful intent, such as damaging the economy of another nation for the purposes of political coercion. By damaging the economy, we mean hurting the people, their livelihoods, their health, their education, a whole range of measures. And thirdly, measures which damage the rights of third parties are also illegal. And fourthly, in more uh, formal terms, in terms of uh, treaty law, they usually also breach international customary law and specific treaties. For example, the WTO, Cuba is a member of the WTO, but it's had almost six decades of um, trade discrimination against us by the US, another member of the, of the WTO, the conventions on postal law, maritime conventions, and so on. So they're the four main categories by which we can say unilateral coercive measures are quite different in character to legitimate international sanctions, and they should not, for this reason, be called sanctions. In practice, unilateral coercive measures aim at regime change, or, or those that aim at regime change, are a form of siege warfare and not sanctions. They're sometimes accompanied by land and sea blockades, as in the early days of the Cuban blockade, in the blockade of Yemen these days. They're always accompanied by propaganda wars. Contemporary examples, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Iran, Syria, Yemen. Partial sanctions on particular resistance groups within countries, like within Iraq and within Lebanon at the moment, uh, in 2021, are much the same as they have few boundaries and embody political coercion in attempts to reduce the influence of those groups. They are attempts at political coercion, which is not uh, considered part of legitimate international sanctions. The unilateral coercive measures against Cuba from 1962, we can see through leaked documents since then, rather explicit evidence as to why they are illegal and not really sanctions. In 1960, a senior US official, Lester Mallory, argued for punishing economic attacks on the Cuban population uh, precisely because they knew that the revolutionary government was very popular amongst the people. Mallory said at the time, the majority of Cubans support Castro. The lowest estimate I've seen is 50 percent. And the only foreseeable means of alienating internal support is through disenchantment and disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship. Every possible means should be undertaken promptly to weaken the economic life of Cuba, to bring about hunger, desperation and overthrow of the government. That's the second head of illegality. It's clearly aimed at hurting people, a criminal intent effectively. So the series of laws and executive orders from 1960 do for the, the subsequent six decades, are those which now comprise what Cuba calls a blockade, in other words, an act of war, an act of economic war, and which the US calls an embargo. In its report for the UN in 2018, and Cuba has uh, made these reports for since the mid 90s, or perhaps the early 90s, um, every year they have a motion to, for countries to oppose what they call the US blockade. 
Uh, Cuba said in 2018 that the US combination of 10 laws and decrees breached the UN Charter and the GATT WTO law while also violating the rights of third party sovereign nations because other third party countries are typically punished for their dealings with Cuba and other countries that against which the US has UCMs. The sanctions in law, um, so-called sanctions, are accompanied by prohibitions, threats and blackmail against third parties by the US government representatives and aim at bringing the Cuban people to its knees by hunger and disease. In other words, the US diplomatic army around the world is at work bus busily making threats and blackmail and bribes and so on to try and get countries to join in um, their blockade of the little independent island. Looking more broadly, the unilateral coercive measures of the US and the European Union in recent times, and this is uh, from the Treasury, US Department of Treasury um, site from 2019, shows us that the US, uh, the US and the European Union have imposed unilateral coercive measures on dozens of countries and only some of those measures have any sort of UN equivalent. For example, in 2019, there were no form of UN sanctions against Belarus, China, Cuba, Nicaragua, Tunisia, Venezuela or Zimbabwe, but they were applied by the USA. And in some cases, the character of UN, UN sanctions, if they exist, were different to the ones applied by the European Union and by the US. It's led to very large um, penalties against third parties. For example, the Obama administration, beginning in 2009, began to impose very large fines. I put the, the, the term in quotes because they're really penalties under US law, which have nothing to do with European law or international law. Um, but this is the scale of the fines against European banks since 2009, um, uh, ranging from tens of millions to more than a billion dollars. Uh, in some cases, hundreds of millions of dollars against individual banks because they had authorized transactions with countries which were under US unilateral coercive measures, in particular Iran and Cuba. So updating that from 2019, 2020, we see it varies quite widely, $1.2 billion in these so-called fines and 23 million in 2020. So how these are applied is that the US Treasury will talk to the bank involved and say, look, you, we understand you've been doing business with Iran and Cuba. Here is the documentation. If you want to keep doing business with us, you'll pay us this fine under US law. Otherwise, you can go ahead and do business with these smaller economies and you'll be banned from um, under our law from doing business in the US. And of course, since the 90s, the takeovers and mergers between US companies and European companies have been very extensive. And so the, U the European economies are very closely linked to the US economies these days and uh, have very little capacity and the governments have very little capacity to resist these demands from the US Treasury. OFAC, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, is the branch of the US Treasury which enforces these sorts of fines. And one, the one good side of things is they have it posted on their site. You can go and find out precisely what happened. It used to be the case that OFAC was imposing fines of, say, $1,000 for US tourists going to Cuba and bringing back Cuban cigars. But in 2009, they decided to focus on bigger players. And that's where these very big third party um, fines came into play. And we see the same sort of pattern with the so-called maximum pressure that former President Trump applied to Iran uh, in 2018, for example. In 2018, the former US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo threatened the Iranian people with imposed hunger if their government persisted with military support for the independent peoples of the region. This is the main reason for the aggression by US against Iran is because Iran supports the resistance in Palestine in the resistance in Lebanon, it supports Syria, it supports the resistance in Iraq, it supports Yemen. So uh, a commentator said the leadership has, has to, sorry, Mike Pompeo said the leadership has to make a decision that they want their people to eat. A very crude way of saying that uh, the US was very happy to make the people of Iran starve. As it happens, they don't really because Iran is a big country which grows enough food to feed its own population. So he was trying to shift the blame for the US aggression onto others, saying it's the 
the Iranian government's responsibility if, if their people starve. So successive UN administrations have normalized these so-called sanctions, sanctions regimes as an aggressive practice which forms part of broader hybrid war and illegitimate regime change strategy. And, and the example I gave from Cuba in the early 60s is very similar to what Pompeo was saying in 2018. The unilateral coercive measures against Lebanon, here's a case where a little country which has partial sanctions or sanctions against particular political parties, particularly, particularly Hezbollah in, uh, in Lebanon, which is now part of the Lebanese government, has been for a number of years. These really have a very similar character because they're attempts to politically coerce the Lebanese body politic. So the US Office of Foreign Assets Control has implemented a Lebanon sanctions program since 2007, after the failure of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, which was rebuffed precisely by um, the Lebanese resistance led by Hezbollah, the, the party, the resistance party. And then the US president back at that time, George W. Bush, issued an executive order 13441 blocking property of persons undermining the sovereignty of Lebanon or its democratic processes and institutions. You notice here is the hegemonic power pretending to talk about its role in protecting Lebanese democracy. It's a farce really, but it's the type of pretense that's very common in US language and US uh, legal construction also. They are assisted, uh, the US measures are assisted within Lebanon by Lebanon Central Bank, which enacts what the US wants there. And its principal target is Hezbollah related operations, but it also includes Iranian and Syrian linked businesses. And it also includes Lebanese linked personalities. So we find, for example, prohibited transactions. They are, for example, uh, one of the sanctioned individuals, and this is individuals are chosen by the US Secretary of Treasury uh, after this law has been created in the US. Um, the Secretary of Treasury can block the property and interests of persons and entities, including corporations, following US uh, guidelines. It's got no basis in international law. And for example, they've used it against a senior, a senior uh, Lebanese official, Gibran Basile, who is one of, in one of the, uh, the progressive Christian parties, precisely because Basile is linked to uh, is in a coalition with Hezbollah, the resistance party there. So effectively, there are no real limits to these so-called partial sanctions. And we'd find the same sort of process applies in Iraq, really. If the US is trying to sanction particular resistance parties in Iraq because they're backed by Iran or whatever, it will flow on to those who are in a coalition with those resistance parties in Iraq and therefore introduce uh, wide-scale political coercion into against the, the Iraqi body politic. So that's why partial sanctions really are, have pretty much the same character as the sanctions against an entire country, a siege measure. So what about the impact of this siege warfare? If we look at the uh, siege warfare on Syria, which has been going on for almost a decade now, the most recent round of it, um, there have been very serious impacts on, for example, the health system um, the, the World Health Organization reported some years back that the, the so-called sanctions were hitting children's cancer treatment, that even though in theory there are some exemptions to the unilateral coercive measures that the US and the European Union impose on Syria, nevertheless, um, it uh, represses the possibility of financing um, resupply of public health systems and so on. Um, and so in practice, um, and I'll come to the UN rapporteurs who've, who've reported on this recently, it, uh, those exemptions are, are not really practical. European Union claimed that food and medicines were exempt under its form of UCMs, but the harsh financial sa uh, sanctions block procurement. The World Health Organization said that there were critical shortages of cancer medication, insulin, anesthetics, antibiotics for intensive care, serums, intravenous fluids and other blood, blood products and vaccines. That was back in 2017. So the Syrian economy as a whole has been hit hard with UCMs affecting all Syrian business for many years now and strong third party UCMs since 2019 under Trump's Caesar law. That is to say other countries doing business with Syria can be attacked also economically um, by the US. <clears throat> the Wall Street Journal headline on the left there 
uh, saying, claiming that the Caesar Act sanctions would hit the Assad family is entirely misleading because the Caesar Act is not about the Assad family principally, it's about the whole of Syria. It's about third parties being attacked for doing business with Syria in the reconstruction. And by the way, of course, in Syria, there are many world heritage sites and the US has managed to block UNESCO, for example, from assisting in the reconstruction, for example, of Aleppo and uh, Palmyra, for example, which are world heritage areas, while UNESCO does in fact help, for example, uh, assist in the reconstruction of non-world heritage sites in Iraq, for example, like Mosul. So the US has managed to um, export its bullying practices, its unilateral coercive measures to UN bodies as well. So on to the third section, addressing siege warfare. What have been the different responses to this type of siege warfare? Well, in response, we've seen uh, UN moves against the UCMs, distinct country strategies and the development of a new commercial and financial architecture. That's really possibly the most powerful underlying process that new uh, forms of commercial and financial architecture are being accelerated by this process. <clears throat> we've seen um, a UN rights expert. Um, there are UN rights experts in certain areas like the right to food and other areas, as well as uh, exper experts specifically to do with reviewing the impact of unilateral coercive measures. And they've been reporting on those sort of regimes against countries like Venezuela, where they've said that they've caused human rights violations, particularly amidst the COVID pandemic. And they've called for these unilateral sanctions to be dropped against Venezuela, for example. So all of this has led to moves against unilateral coercive measures at the United Nations. So in 2014, the UN Human Rights Council adopted measure 2721 on human rights and unilateral coercive measures. And it has since appointed experts to investigate UCMs used against several countries. Uh, and that includes investigations by other experts, such as in the right to food, for example, who looked at the impact on Yemen. So here, in 2015, Hilal Elva, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food, um, looked at the food crisis in Yemen and warned of the deliberate starvation of civilians by the siege measures imposed on Yemen, which are still in place six years later on. Uh, a UN human rights expert also urged the US to remove its so-called sanctions, which were hindering rebuilding in Syria, for example, in 2021. The, the anti-blockade diplomatic campaign by Cuba shows one approach by a country under siege for a long period of time, for almost six decades. Cuba has mounted this very successful uh, diplomatic campaign against the blockade, and in the US they call it an embargo. For example, in 2021, 184 countries voted for Cuba's motion against the blockade on Cuba only two against, and that was the US and Israel, which Israel in most cases like this always votes with the US, and there were only three abstentions. The big achievement of Cuba diplomatically in recent uh, decades has been that in the 90s, many people supported its motions too, but a lot abstained. They were sitting on the fence more or less, and these days there are very few abstentions. You'll notice that it's Ukraine and Brazil, some extreme right-wing regimes aligned with the US that are even abstaining now. Even many of the US allies uh, vote for the Cuban motion these days. So that's been uh, a very successful strategy diplomatically, even though it hasn't shifted much of the actual measures against uh, that, that Washington has against Cuba, but nevertheless, it's been influential with other countries. So there are distinct strategies. Cuba has had this very successful diplomatic campaign um, helped by its popular medical assistance missions in many, many countries and its mass doctor training. The Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is a very large state and able to resist through its self-sufficiency a lot of these measures, has developed a resistance economy model. That is to say, taking the economic measures against Iran as an opportunity to develop its own industries. Um, import substitution and turning them into export oriented industries like Iran's, many of Iran's high tech areas and even steel. Iran was an importer of steel, now it's an exporter of steel. While it builds stronger links with Russia, China and other independent states like Cuba and Venezuela. <clears throat> 
Um, Iran is now industrializing Cuban medicines, for example. North Korea, the DPRK, in a long-term state of war, 70 years really, has maintained an assertive and self-reliant strategy, distinct from Cuba, but nevertheless uh, another approach um, using the concept of Juche, with Juche is about self-reliance to a large extent. But now uh, North Korea is building stronger links with China. Behind this, there has been the catalyzing of these new commercial and financial architecture relationships, particularly in West Asia, where the economic siege has been very strong. So the axis of resistance countries and Iran-led alliance, feared by Israeli and US leaders, precisely because its basis is opposition to Israel and Israeli expansion in the region and to US domination of the region. And as I said before, Iran has helped a number of independent countries. Well, there are some important allies to that axis who share only some of those objectives. So Russia, China, for example, um, are important allies for Iran and the axis of resistance, even though they don't share the same perspective on Israel. And then there are other allies like Venezuela and Cuba. The likelihood of a West Asian alliance is going to have implications in the areas of military infrastructure, finance, commerce, education and training. And those are really um, in opposition to the type of counter alliance that Washington has been trying to create, which it's called an Arab NATO, centered on the Saudis and some of the other Persian Gulf monarchies. And of course, what's seen as a threat by Washington is seen as an opportunity for the besieged resistance countries. So the sort of infrastructural developments, um, highways, um, uh, train, train lines, um, internet connections, um, commercial links between Tehran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon um, and Palestine are the opportunities that's been looked for by the axis of resistance, a resistance economy which could help develop an economically integrated regional bloc. The important counterweights or allies in this process, of course, are Russia and China, which the US wanted to exclude from West Asia, but which have been included precisely because of the, the failing wars across several countries there. There have been these strategic shifts. Russia, for example, but also Venezuela and other countries are now committed to multipolarity, that is to say, to moving away from a global system that is focused around the US to uh, multipolar, in other words, different uh, poles of power around the world, which is precisely what the US tried to prevent. Russia and China have been increasingly uh, increasing their trade amongst each other, their strategic cooperation amongst each other and with Iran, and the US dollar will soon be undermined by China's digital yuan. So these are the strategic shifts that are undermining the type of process that Washington had uh, tried to reinforce with its economic wars. Some commentators have said that the huge China-Iran deal, for example, announced recently a $400 billion deal, was very important for its strategic significance in the Middle East. Um, and the most conspicuous rationale was um, for the, the other side, the US-Israeli-Saudi alliance was curtailing Iranian hegemony and Chinese involvement, but they have actually instead catalyzed more of that. And coming up behind that has been the not just the military involvement of Russia in the region in support of the resistance factions, but also um, new sectoral economic ties and mega infrastructure, um, weaponry, um, strategic ports and so on with Iran, modernizing the Iranian na Navy. So the role of Russia has been growing as the role of China is now growing in the region. And that's contrary to what the US wanted and tried to reinforce with its unilateral coercive measures. So in summary, the US in decline has expanded a type of hybrid warfare in attempts to preserve its international influence, particularly in Europe and in Asia and in the space in between. And the economic siege wars have been a part of this hybrid warfare. There is such a thing as sanctions, as legitimate instruments of um, to uh, form a judicious punishment or corrective measure against wrongdoing under international law, but those sanctions should be distinguished from the far more numerous unilateral coercive measures, which are really a type of siege warfare. And there have been a range of responses to those UCMs. For example, the UN itself, through the General Assembly, has created mechanisms to report on and denounce the impact of those UCMs. 
there have been those different types of state responses, the resistance economy of Iran, the diplomatic offensive of Cuba, the Juche self-reliance approach of North Korea. And there are, has been the catalyzing of this new international commercial and financial architecture.